Well, I want to thank everyone for gathering here in this very special part of our island, you know, on Waikiki, Kohio Beach. You look at the water behind us. I know guys like Andrew, I want to go in the water, Chief Kealoha, yeah, Ikaika. In a place that's vibrant, in a place that is the, the engine of growth for the city and county of Honolulu, for the island of Oahu, and for the state of Hawaii. I like to say, as Waikiki, as Waikiki goes, so does Oahu, and as Oahu goes, so, so does the entire state. And today we're here to talk about some new initiatives regarding homelessness. As you know, this is a growing and evolving um, issue in our entire community. There's no part of our community that isn't touched by this issue. It changes and varies in the communities that we find it in. In Waikiki, it's somewhat unique. In Chinatown, it's also a unique situation. But we have homeless families on the Leeward Coast. Uh, we have families on the North Shore, in Waimanalo, and many other places. And we need to do more. And today is about doing more. Today is about partnering up with a whole bunch of people, all the different stakeholders, from the folks at the city and county of Honolulu who have been ver working very hard, to our police officers who do an incredible job making us one of the safest big cities in the United States of America, to our providers who are addressing this issue every single day and are looking to move the needle even more, and then our private sector here in the visitor industry and around our community. And what I want to talk about is that we are stepping up what we call compassionate disruption. I think it is incredibly cruel to just drive by homeless folks and ignore them as if they don't exist, those who have mental challenges and addictions, and say, let them fend for themselves. That is not a sign of a community, of a society that cares for all its people. And so we are doing what we call compassionate disruption. In other words, we're increasing enforcement to encourage folks to no longer live on the streets and to move into shelters and more importantly, as we roll out Housing First, which is permanent supportive housing with wraparound services to deal with addictions, uh, drug and alcohol, and mental illness, so people can live a better life. And if we don't, if we let it be convenient to sleep, for example, on these sidewalks in Waikiki or in our parks around the island, it just means that those activities continue, but we don't get people into permanent supportive housing to be treated and to be made better. And I think everyone here wants to take care of those who are having a hard time taking care of themselves. It's what civilized people do. I believe it's what Americans do. And so there's two, two, two parts of this. On one hand is compassionate disruption, and the other hand it is about permanent supporting housing. And you need both coming together in order to get the result, the holistic result that we need. And here's what we've been doing. And I want two gentlemen to talk about it. One is on the enforcement issue is the stepped up enforcement that we see among our police officers. And I'm going to ask Chief Keloha to say a few words. But before he does, I want to emphasize this to everyone. Homelessness, homeless folks are not being targeted, but we are looking into where crime exists. And to the extent there's criminal activity in the homeless population, it will be pursued. And the chief has been doing an incredible job in the past couple months really pursuing that site. So I'd like to turn it over to Chief Keloha, and I want to thank Chief Keloha, his entire senior team standing here today, and many of the officers that are in this area, plus those you will never see who every day do heroic work for all of us that make us that safe, one of the safest big cities in the country. So Chief Keloha, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We receive a lot of complaints about um, people peddling on the street, uh, people drinking in the uh, parks, and also people lying down and leaving their trash behind on the sidewalks. We also had complaints about uh, homelessness, uh, people urinating and defecating uh, on the sidewalks and leaving it in front of uh, the businesses. So we really wanted to take a close look at Waikiki. Waikiki is the economic engine for the entire state. And why we needed to do that, to look at Waikiki specifically, is because we need to take care of Waikiki because what happens here affects the perception uh, throughout the nation and throughout the world. So some things that we found is that, um, you know, the violations like in Kapiolani Park, you know, um, since January, uh, we issued 
uh, 788, close to 800 citations for park closure and camping. Uh, we made 10 arrests, uh, peddling, uh, especially in Waikiki, specifically in Waikiki. We issued 36 citations and made 17 arrests, liquor violations. Uh, we issued 116 citations and 17 arrests. And the smoking violations, that law that just came in, into effect not too long ago, we actually issued 111 citations. Um, but here's a story that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, several weeks ago, we received a complaint uh, from the public about uh, this person was dressed up as Spider-Man. And the complaint was that he was a little aggressive on panhandling. He would allow people to take the photographs you know, of him uh, you know, with, with the visitor. And then later on, he would ask for money. But he was really, really persistent. And we got the complaints. So what happened is one of our officers uh, was watching the person in a costume. And when the officer had the violation, uh, she went up and initiated the arrest. Well, lo and behold, when we did the background search on this uh, person, he actually was a probation violator from the state of Florida. And what happened is we called Florida and they said, hey, we want this guy back. So the officers from Florida came down and he was extradited back to Florida. And uh, his bail was a 50,000 cash only bail. So this is what we're looking at. It's not a crime to be homeless, but when the criminals who happen to be homeless violates the law, that's when law enforcement uh, gets involved. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I do believe that with the uh, HPD led by Chief Kailoa's initiatives here in Waikiki, this stepped up enforcement where there is crime in the homeless population is making a difference in Waikiki. But also, what is also making a difference is our enforcement of our start property ordinance and our sidewalk nuisance ordinance. As you know, these laws were passed two, three years ago. And when I became mayor, we really stepped it up. We created a special team that would go out at two in the morning when parks were closed to remove things that were blocking our access to our sidewalks and other public areas. And these places were built for people to walk on, not to camp on, not to put things on, not to sleep on or lie on, but for the traverse, for all of the public to use, everyone. No one person has a right to the sidewalk. And Ross Sassamore, Director of Division of Facility Maintenance, has led that effort. And we have had success, and I, Ross, Ross is gonna show you some of the pictures here that show success. But he's been focused in Waikiki recently, and I want him to share with you what he's been doing there. Um, so Ross, we'd like to step up. Very lucky to have this man. He never stops working, totally dedicated and loves his community. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ross Asamore. I'm the Director and Chief Engineer for the Department of Facility Maintenance. The Department of Facility Maintenance has specific authority and responsibility for city infrastructure to include sidewalks and streets. And as far as sidewalks are concerned, sidewalks are designed for pedestrians, for people to use to traverse from one place to another. What's important and foremost for us is that pedestrians that use the sidewalks lawfully and correctly are able to do so safely. And one of the impediments that a lot of pedestrians have are accumulations of belongings. Whether they belong to people that are in dire need of a home, or whether they belong to abutting homeowners. Our department actually enforces the city ordinances uniformly and without any type of, any type of prejudice. We specifically have actually enforced and issued 456 sidewalk nuisance violations from 2013 till today. As far as stored property ordinance is concerned, that piece of legislation, that law, is what we use from time to time to also enforce situations in residential areas where we have actually gone in and removed basketball backstops that people have. The portable ones that you may see at a sporting goods store, those things fall under our jurisdiction as well when they're left either on sidewalks and they block passage or even on cul-de-sacs on city streets where they don't belong. We've actually enforced the, side, uh, the stored property ordinance with 233 violations. 
from January of 2013 to present. What's important also is for me to mention that in our enforcement actions that take place at any time of day, at any day of the week, we've removed over 235 tons of debris. That's material that does not get stored, that does not get put away, that does not get reclaimed by people. This is just trash. Things like pallets, discarded food containers, and other litter that would otherwise end up in the storm drains and out onto our beautiful beaches and oceans. When Mayor Caldwell came into office, we established a contract crew, a temporary crew of seven people that have been actively enforcing both the sidewalk nuisance ordinance and the stored property ordinances. July 1st of 2014, we will begin the actual process of making a full-time civil service crew that's dedicated to this effort. So up until now, we've been utilizing temporary people on contracts to carry forward our mission, but that mission will be made permanent, effective, the beginning of the next fiscal year, which will begin in a few weeks. So we'll continue to enforce. We'll continue to keep the sidewalks clear and, and safe and passable for all the pedestrians. And we look forward to hearing from any concerns that the public may have because all of our enforcement actions are complaint driven. So the telephone number to my office is 768-3343. And if there are any specific concerns relating to block passage on sidewalks, any concerns about stored property that may cause harm or pose a safety hazard to motorists, Please call my office and let us know. We'll be out there to enforce. Um, so as you heard, part of it is, is existing tools that we have in terms of compassionate disruption and stepped-up enforcement. In addition, we are looking at new tools, and it's something that has been talked about recently in the press, I think very well, and that is the two bills that we put in. One is the sit lie bill, Bill 42, and the other one is the public urination and defecation bill, Bill 43, that were put in late last week and we're going to be working closely with the council to get them passed. They were introduced uh, by Chair Martin on, on, at our request, and um, we believe they're going to help us even be more effective, particularly with the things that Ross's crew can't do. They can remove things that are obstructing sidewalks, but actual individuals who may be lying down on the sidewalk in places like Kalakawa and making it difficult for people to walk and actually creating a potential danger where someone could trip, these tools will allow us and allow the police to enforce and ask people to move along. And the sit lie bill has been patterned after a, a law that was passed in Seattle that's withstood constitutional scrutiny. Um, and what's a little different than Seattle, it's a 24-7 uh, enforcement. And some may ask, how come? And the reason is, is that Waikiki never sleeps. This place is busy all the time. You come here at four in the morning, there are people walking, uh, people are coming out of establishments, and many visitors are waking up early because of the time difference, jet lag, and they want to get out and see the sun rise and go for a run. And so this bill is going to be applied and enforced on a 24-7 basis here in Waikiki. If it works here, we'll look to take it to places like Chinatown and other communities around the island. This bill, the way it's been written, the title and the purpose clause is limited to Waikiki and it can't be amended for that reason. But I want to let you know we're going to see how it works here and then we recognize it could be effective in other communities too. On the public defecation and urination bill, we have a law in place in Chinatown, and we want to now extend it to Waikiki. And it's just one more tool in the toolbox to help our police officers um, dealing with problems, in this case, of health and safety. And should it work, um, we will look at applying it to other parts of our community too. Before I go on to the next phase, I do want to emphasize one thing. You may wonder why are we standing right here? It's a beautiful place. But right behind us is the Bistro. This is a new establishment that opened up back in April. As you may recall, if we would have taken pictures of this place, you couldn't sit at any of the picnic tables here. They were occupied all the time for, by homeless people during the day. And no visitor, no local person, not me, if I came in from stand-up paddleboarding, could I come here and sit. And so we, this is part of a creative way to address the problem. We went out and we worked with a vendor who operates the cafe just down the street on a pilot basis to see if it would work here. As you can see, it's very friendly and inviting. All of us can come. 
great food. Their, po their pork, the pulled pork, the Kahlua pork is onolicious. I've had it already. Um, and I may have it again today after the press conference. The point is it's a, it's a way to make this more inviting and friendly to everyone. The people who come here to enjoy, Waikiki as visitors and local folks who come. And that's why we chose this place. The next thing I want to talk about is what do we do in terms of housing? How can we better in be better in terms of housing our folks who right now are on our sidewalks and in our parks? And I would like Ember Shin, the Managing Director of the City and County of Honolulu, and Pam Woody Oakland, the Director of uh, Community Services, to both describe how we're going to do this. Before they do, I do, Kaika Anderson is going to be speaking. But there's no doubt in my mind, his stepping up at the last hour, right before midnight, before the budget was put to bed, and coming up with a compromise at one, saved our very, very effective road repaving program, which Ikaika supports, as do many council members, as do the residents of this island. Saving that road repaving program, while at the same time looking for a compromise to do more and better with housing. Um, we're going to be talking about exactly that, and then Ikaika is going to be talking afterwards. So you've heard a lot of us talk about this permanent support of housing, sometimes called Housing First, and there are people who question whether it will work. And it does work on the mainland, it's evidence-based, it's fact-based, and it's proven success. Um, but to talk a little bit more about the success of, of the program, and I think maybe it'd be good maybe to have U.S. vets come up and talk about their experience and actual, an actual success story. Just one, but I think it speaks volumes of their success to come as we roll out this program. So if it's okay, I'd like U.S. vets to come up and, and say a few words. We're going to be having um, Adam talk on behalf of Scott Fox, who is a veteran. We served our country well. And why don't you come stand over oh, here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Adam. I'm the coordinator for U.S. Vets Housing First program. I just want to briefly introduce Scott. Scott's one of our participants in the program. Uh, he was one of the first uh, to come into our Housing First program. And he's been one of the uh, models of success. Uh, as far as being uh, uh, a client in our program. He's been successfully housed for 16 months, um, has a good positive attitude, he's a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and uh, he's a model tenant and neighbor. And I just wanted to uh, just give Scott, you know, the, pro the proper... <laughs> Scott, I don't know if you want to say something. Or... Well, before I was accepted into the program. I was staying down the Kehi Lagoon Beach Park. In and out of there for, God, four or five years between that and Kawawa Basin living on a friend's boat. And there's a big difference between being outside all the time and actually having a nice, safe place to come home to at the end of the day. I mean, it makes a big difference. Now, if it hadn't been for you as vets, I'd still be out there. And words can't describe how grateful I am because they basically saved my life in numerous ways. So without Adam here and all the counselors and staff members down at Barber's Point, it's been a real change for the better. And I just want to say I'm grateful. Thanks. Um, I do want to have a few of the visitor industry folks talk to, but before I do that, I do want to have Ikaika Anderson say a few words. You know, Ikaika is a great council member. I, when I was the majority leader, I camp campaigned for him twice because I saw his potential. Not only that, he's lived up and exceeded everything that, that you would want from an incredible council member. The Windward side is lucky to have him. And he, as we mentioned, he helped uh, save the day and provide more money uh, to, to do more for the homeless population. As you heard um, Scott Fox just talk, we want to have more stories like that to share in the future with all of you. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, Ikaika Anderson. Thanks for being here, Ikaika. Thank you, Mirko.
Aloha. The Honolulu City Council certainly recognizes the importance of Waikiki, not only to the city and county of Honolulu, but to the state of Hawaii as a whole, as our economic engine. Coincidentally, Mr. Mayor, I introduced the resolution, resolution 14-117 recently. And what this resolution will do is start a comprehensive discussion on an evaluation of the entire Waikiki Special Design District. And what we hope to do here, Mr. Mayor, is as a council, take a look policy-wise on the types of activities and on the types of policy initiatives that we want to see within the Waikiki Special Design District to be able to protect it and to be able to regulate the types of activities that will and will not be permitted within its parameters. Now this resolution is a very broad one and the reason that it was written so broad is because it is designed to initiate a very comprehensive review and discussion of the Waikiki Special Design District. Resolution 14-117 will be heard in the City Council Zoning and Planning Committee, which I chair, next week Thursday at 9 a.m. at Honolulu Hale. Mr. Mayor, we will also be taking a look at the two bills that you've introduced and if we can and if permitted by Sunshine Law, we would like to have a discussion so that we can start talking about the initiatives that you're planning to implement in your two bills at the same time that we have our comprehensive discussion of the Waikiki Special Design District. But I have talked with uh, Council Chair Martin and you do have the commitment from the Honolulu City Council leadership to work with you and your administration on bettering Waikiki, ensuring that we protect it for generations to come, and to ensure that we also protect it as our state and our city's economic engine, and that we work together, City Council, mayor, mayoral administration, towards coming together and being able to put together a sound policy. Thank you. Thank you, Pekka. Really appreciate it. Thanks so Thank much. I was handed this that I forgot to mention earlier. So on Housing First, you heard uh, Scott Fox talk. We also put together a Housing First manual, again, because people sometimes question, what is this? I call it permanent supportive housing. But I like it starts off with homelessness touches us all. It does. And you heard the story of Scott, a veteran, a Marine, who came back after serving his country and fell on hard times, and U.S. vets helped him. But that story is repeated by others, Connie Mitchell's group, Waikiki Health Center, and many others. And this talks about this new initiative that we're going to be undertaking. I have one more thing I do want to talk about. But before I do that, I would like George Segetti, on behalf of the visitor industry. As you know, George is head of tourism and lodging. Great guy, another guy who loves the water on top of many other things. He loves Waikiki. You just hear from him a little bit in terms of how you see all of this working and really forming a partnership. You know, so many people say, what are you going to do about homelessness? And the you is whoever you're talking to. And I turn it around and say, what are we going to do? Because no one person created homelessness and no one person is going to solve it. It's all of us coming together. It's about the we that's going to really make that difference and move the needle. And George is part of that we. So George? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I didn't plan on speaking, but since I am, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here today. We've been talking about this for well over a year now, working very closely with the mayor and his team. I'm very, very encouraged, extremely encouraged of uh, all that the mayor and his department heads, uh, what our enforcement agencies are doing. I thank them and our, and our agencies that are helping the people on the street, extremely important. What I'm very encouraged about is to see everybody come together, not only the state, the city, the county, the, the nonprofits, the private sector, all coming together to tackle a very complex a very complex issue that is not only across the country, through our state, but now um, obviously in Waikiki. Uh, it's the number one complaint I get. I get it nonstop from, from visitors just the other day, one coming up saying, we've been coming here for 15 years. We love Hawaii, but we're not coming back anymore until you take care of this problem. So when it hits home like that, I think it's extremely important that we all uh, we all take on this very complex issue. So I want to really thank the mayor because we had a meeting yesterday. We've been talking for a long time. He says now's the time for action. And if we can give him the tools through these new ordinances to be able to give to, to be able to um, 
you know, clean up our streets, take back our streets, take back our parks, take back our, our benches, and give them to the, back to the local people and to the visitors alike is it's very, very important. So I'm going to get off the stage. I thank the mayor and everyone in, here today. Extremely important, important issue. Thank you. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I think George said it so well that I'm going to end the press conference at this point. Um, he explained it, I think he summed it up just beautifully. And we'll open up to questions for any and all of us. We have the providers here, you have the, the chief here, you have Ross Asamora. Uh, any and all questions on homelessness that you can all hear. If you're going to ask on other issues, let's do it one on one afterwards and we'll fo keep the focus right now on just our initiatives. Here in Waikiki. I understand you're taking a more of a scattered approach as opposed to, to purchasing one building, an existing building, or, or putting up a new facility. You're taking a more scattered approach where you're looking at individual units scattered throughout the island. Can you explain? So, um, as you know, housing, the housing first model, the su uh, permanent supportive housing model, really can work in various ways. You don't have to buy a, a huge building like one across the street and put a, a population of, of, of chronic homeless people into it. You could do it individual units. We've talked about maybe, you know, using this 20 studio units. You could be scattered around in places like Waikiki, Chinatown, and other areas like that. That's not to say that if the right opportunity came up and we could get a building for a reasonable price or even a deal, we would jump at that because we want to make the best use of the money that we have. But whether we put everyone in it, that they'd be a chronic homeless person, as you know, the 32 million that, that Ikaika helped put in there gave us flexibility in terms of what type of population can go into, it could be mixed housing. And I do believe we don't want to create a ghetto. We'd like to see chronic homeless folks there, but maybe some middle income folks there too. Mixed housing for various groups of people, because we believe recovery is about living in a healthy neighborhood. And so we may, as you, Andrew, that's your question, we may buy an entire building, but I don't think you see the entire building filled with chronic homeless folks. Do you, uh, do you see any pushback from folks that, that have an existing building and, and maybe they, they don't want to see a homeless person move in next to them and expect any pushback from, from that? There could be, uh, but what we have, once the, this money was announced, developers have approached us about um, either partnering up with them to build a building or perhaps looking at individual units in their building because they see opportunity here. Having the city and county of Honolulu as the rent pair, no one's going to default in that rent. They like that. Um, and I, I do believe that this, this solving this problem and helping folks like Scott does mean that when they say, what are you going to do about homelessness? And I turn it around and meets each individual has to be willing to accept someone living in their community, whether it be a floor of their building or in their neighborhood, to get better. Otherwise, we don't solve that problem. Is there a residency requirement or is this just for all the tourists? We'll work with the provider community to identify the appropriate people once we have the shelter in place. They have, you know, the Housing First has an assessment component of it, so they identify all the homeless and then they prioritize it. So we'll be working with the provider community. How are you ensuring that what this doesn't do is just move homeless out of Waikiki into Waikiki or into Manoa or just into the next neighborhood where these ordinances won't be enforced? Well, here's the thing, you can't guarantee that, and probably that's what's going to happen. But this is just um, something that we have to work through. Like the mayor said, you know, through uh, the city, the partnerships with the state, even private business, we work together and then we can resolve this issue. The police alone cannot enforce, you know, uh, the law and leave it at that and expect homelessness to go away. This is something, you know, one of the comments I heard earlier today is that, you know, they seem to see a lot of, of our homeless that come from out of state. Well, here's the thing, it's been happening for over 30 years. That's what they call the uh, green, greyhound therapy. And they would come here and, you know, and, and then, you know, we have to deal with that. So there's no guarantees and we don't know. And that's why, you know, we do this first and along the way, then we identify what issues we have and challenges that we have to overcome. So this isn't you know, we're, we're, we're city employees, we're government people, we're servants, we're not magicians. This isn't going to happen overnight. So um, it is going to take some time. Can I just, Jesse, can you bring that, that board up? Just, I want to emphasize, like a part of what we're talking about here is a two-handed approach. The enforcement makes it less convenient and comfortable to be in our sidewalks and in our parks. 
So we do move them around from place to place. There are fewer homeless, I believe, in Waikiki today because Ross, Sassamore, and crew has been here for almost three weeks. And we get reports that there are fewer encampments, fewer things. But without the housing component, you won't see that holistic approach that we're talking about. And if you make it less convenient to be on sidewalks and parks, they will move voluntarily into permanent supportive housing. We've also been told, and I know, Connie, if you want to answer this, but that when we do these aggressive, compassionate disruption activities in an area, they do see an uptick in those people coming into shelter. So we know it works. Connie, do you want to add any? I don't want to speak for you, but perhaps then. Maybe what can you First of all, I want to thank the mayor for his efforts because I think it's a very comprehensive approach. But I do think that when people are moved and they are uncomfortable, they make different choices. And until people are uncomfortable enough, they won't make the choice to accept services sometimes. We have had great success you know, in really helping some of the people that are very, very disabled you know, to come into the shelter and to actually transition into more stable housing. I particularly, as a provider, do not like to see people lying on the streets they are very prone to infections. They bring in a lot of things into the shelter as well. And so I think this is a great way to begin to um, merge all of our efforts together. And I want to thank the mayor for his efforts. Thank you. We did have one other initiative that we're going to be implementing, and that is a 24-7 uh, bathroom in Waikiki, uh, to, to your question. So we have these three, we have a lot of, we have three beautiful bathrooms here that are clean six times a day. The Waikiki Business um, Association helps with this. Uh, cleaning and of course we the parks and rec folks that you see walking around clean these bathrooms six times a day they open at five in the morning they close at 10 at night and then they open again the next morning but what happens late at night and so we've heard from the visitor industry and saying we need a bathroom that's open 24 7. we have a bathroom that we're willing to turn over to the waikiki business improvement district should they accept it and it will be the bathroom closest to the police station so it's a little safer and we have 52,000, is it 50 or 52,000? 52,000 that was put into the budget by the council member who represents Waikiki, Stanley Chang, to keep this bathroom open when we close it at five. We're, our request is that the visitor industry step up, some organization working with the WBID to open it during that period of time. We can't, um, but we believe the 52,000 is a good start and if it works, then we could look for more money. We're gonna to have to see if it works. Some people say that people at this end of Waikiki aren't gonna walk four blocks to use the bathroom. In Chinatown, we have a bathroom in our police substation, and people still will go on the streets just one block down from there. They don't wanna walk. But I say, let's try. To your question that you get at your station, to the question we get at the city every single day. And so we're looking to work with the WBID and others in the industry. We talked about it yesterday with George Segetti's group. And as soon as that can be resolved, we'd like to announce how it's gonna work and it would be open. Of course, it need to be staffed. You know, at that time of the night, bad things could happen unless there is someone in the bathroom to make sure that people are just in there to use the bathroom. So that's where WBID would step in? They would that's correct. The they would staff, they would, they would hire staff. We're putting in city money, $52,000 who would pay that staff but they would hire the staff, they'd help maintain it during that off hour period. I don't think the use is gonna be heavy at that time. I think 10 at night till five in the morning. So that person would be there to make sure it's clean and that person would be there to make sure it's safe. And of course, if anything bad or dangerous happened, they would call 911 and the police would rush over there all over Waikiki at all hours of the day anyway, making sure it's a safe place. A lot of these plans seem to hinge on cooperation and partnership. Have you guys identified or has anyone come forward to make a whether it's to the city and county, whether it's to the state, to say this is something that we're taking seriously enough that we want to identify a neighborhood or an apartment building or funding that can help make these initiatives possible. I mean, we're talking, I think, in such hypotheticals right. that people want to know how is this going to actually happen in a year or two years. So one, I do think you see the, uh, the forming of a real partnership on the state level, starting with the governor and then Colin. I mean, Colin, in some ways, he feels like he's part of our cabinet. I mean, he's at many, many different meetings. Um, you have the private sector, the providers here, Connie and others, Waikiki Kelson, U.S. Vets, and many who aren't here today that we meet with on a regular basis. And then you have the private sector visitor industry. I think it's just been one week since we closed our budget. And of course, we can't make a promise that next week we're going to have a unit. 
But I do know that we have started to make a difference, you can see in terms of the enforcement part, and I believe that working with the private sector and our, and our providers, that you'll see in the next, starting in August through our rental housing program, um, rent to work program, that you'll start seeing homeless moving into shelter, permanent supportive housing, and building more in the next year or two. If I have it my way, I want to go faster. But we don't want to make promises we can't deliver. I do think it's a valid question to ask, but I'd say let's get together in a year and we can give you those metrics. We are going to measure this. Uh, we're going to say we know from time to time how many people are in Waikiki and we can report whether they're coming off the streets and into housing or not. And if we're doing our job right, it should get less. If we're not doing our job right, we need to recalibrate and figure out how to make it right. It's been a long press conference. I think it's time to hit the water or the bistro. Uh, okay.